Hey, this is Brad from Devourment. You're watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Richard Metal Fan Interviews. This is episode number 152. And today's guest, I'm talking with Brad Fincher. Brad Fincher is the drummer and founding member of the band Devourment, a brutal death metal band been around since the mid-90s. Today we're going to be talking to him about what got him into metal, basically going, going through his discography and the albums that he's played on, and much, much more. So, without further ado, let's go talk to Brad. So what's up, guys? I'm here with Brad Fincher from the Almighty Devourment. So how are you doing today, Brad? Pretty good, man. How are you doing? Doing pretty well. A little bit bit tired. Tired, worked a 10-hour shift, but I'm ready for an interview. <laughs> right on, man. Hell yeah. So kind of like the format is, I want to talk about like your journey as a musician from where you started to now and sort of like do like a rundown of your discography, but take me back to young Brad Fincher. So kind of growing up, what were the first bands that got you into metal and what made you want to start playing drums? Oh, wow. Going way back. Uh, actually, I started on guitar. Uh, so I actually wanted to be a guitar player for longer. Like, uh, and the things that got me into that was like the first White Snake record and like Steve Vai and Joe Satriani and like uh, then I got like really into thrash metal and I wanted to be like Alex Skolnick and all the guys the guys in Testament and stuff like that so uh, that was my like I guess introduction into like heavy music was really getting into thrash metal in the late 80s and trying to be a wannabe guitar player in high school and then um, I think I kind of discovered you know uh, death metal we would watch i'd watch headbangers ball all the time on mtv back in the day in the early 90s yeah. and um i saw the first two things that like really got me were uh napalm death stuff for the children video and sepulcher arise and that was like a huge eye-opener for me like what is this stuff that's the first time i ever heard like blast beats and crazy vocals and stuff i was like that's i'm that's i immediately like gravitated towards it and um but yeah, so then high school, that's what I was basically into, trying to do guitar stuff. And I'd always get in bands, uh, start bands up or whatever in high school. And usually what would happen was uh, I would always struggle on guitar. And like every time we'd like take a break or something, I'd wind up just like getting on the drums, <laughs> whoever we had playing drums at the time. And I wound up being usually being a better drummer than whoever we had. <laughs> and it just like became... <laughs> It came easier to me, so I was like, I think I think I should play drums. And the fact that um, after a while, like doing other band stuff, it seemed like it was much easier to find somebody who played guitar the way I wanted to, to be in a band, rather than it was much harder to find drummers. So I was like, I, I, yeah, I'm gonna stick with this. And then um, had my first like proper death metal band in my like senior year of high school, which I played death metal uh, drums for, and that was you know. Uh, I think Tomb of the Mutilated style Cannibal Corpse. That was the first like brutal, really heavy stuff. And I just was immediately hooked and started trying to play that. Awesome. Um, that was high school. But so that's how it kind of started. And then after that, I just um, moved away to college and did all that stuff that I did in Texas and found, you know, all the other death metal people <laughs> around here. And just kind of plugged myself into the metal scene in Dallas and you know, networked and found other people going to shows and uh, started my, joined my first, I, I guess, real death metal band, which was called Kill Switch at the time, but uh, yeah. which we, I later changed to Necroside, which became like proto devourment eventually. So Awesome. And so tell me about like Necroside, side, because, because there's not really much I could, fi I could find about, about, about it. Is there anything like, like online about for Necroside? Yeah, there's uh, our, our buddy who runs Corpse Crystal Records, Hound, um, Paul. He, um, I think, reissued uh, like our deck, Necroside. He did like a three song, or I can't even remember now what it was. Like a sort of demo, sort of EP thing. Um, so that's, it's out there somewhere, but yeah, it's kind of hard to find. But um, yeah, that's basically what we did. Uh, it was just, I think we just did a few songs, recorded, and kind of, that kind of fell apart. and from the ashes of that kind of started devourment. Yeah. And how did, how did devourment form? Because I know y'all formed in 1995. How'd you get to know like, like Ruben and everybody else? Yeah. The initial, the very first thing was like, uh, 
the necrocyte was kind of ending and me and the guitar player at the time, a guy named Braxton Henry, uh, kind of wanted to like leave and do our own thing and pursue a, you know, a heavier, even heavier stuff than what we were doing in necrocyte. And we got really into, you know, the New York bands like Pyrexia and Suffo and internal bleeding and stuff like that. So we wanted to go more in that direction and start a new band. And for, I don't know where it came from. I honestly don't know. Uh, I was just in a parking lot with him one day and we're like, talking about doing this project i'm like uh how about devourment as the name i just like popped into my head and i was like yeah that's it all right so that's the name <laughs> so we had the name right away and it was just me and him we're gonna do it and find you know the the other pieces that we needed um but stuff happened life happened i went away to school for a little bit and by the time i came back he was in another band doing something else so that's when i found uh wayne our singer from another band, local band called Meatus, and didn't have a guitar player. So I was like, that's kind of the key, right? If, if this is going to work or not. Um, he knew a guy named Brain at the time, Brian Wynn. And we, he was like, you need to, let's try jamming with this guy. Let's try this guy out and see what happens. And I jammed with him at his house uh, in Fort Worth. And that was it. We were like, we knew exactly, you know, the whole cliche thing. You, you kind of click with somebody immediately as far as like musical vision. So we had the name, we had a guitar player and we had our singer, <laughs> Wayne Canup, rest in peace. Um, yeah. And that was pretty much it. That's what we knew. That kind of solidified the first iteration of Devourment. We did our demo and uh, impaled demo, three song demo. That kind of was uh, no. what started it all before. Eventually yeah, it's very raw movie. sounding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think we, we recorded it in some guy's like living room in his trailer. So, um, but yeah, that led to stuff happening and um, where we eventually, like a year later, so we got to the point where, all right, we have an album's worth of material. Let's make this album. We're going to call it Most of the Decapitated. Um, and, stuff, uh, you know, things didn't work out with Wayne. So we, lost him we knew reuben as a friend who just hung around and he was i think a friend of wayne's as well and yeah. tried him out it's like uh, wow that guy's amazing okay so so he's in so that was it and that was basically and then we that was the three of us the core guitar vocals and drums that was pretty much all we needed then we just rounded out with bass and we um again our hound a friend of ours uh introduced us to mike majewski who uh was just a fan and uh, became our artist and did all, all of our early artwork and he came to one of our practices and was kind of blown away. And he was like, we we're like, we need a bass player. <laughs> so if you want to learn how to play bass, you can do that. So um, he didn't know how to play anything at the time. So we just bought him a bass and he taught himself yeah. how to play bass. We got that. And then we stole uh, Kevin, uh, the second guitar player from this local band called Century, which was really awesome as well. Another OG TXDM band. And that was that was the final lineup for MCD, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and tell me, because I know your first label was United Guttural Records. Was that sort of like a local label in Texas at the time? And how did they find Devourment? Yeah, people are going to kill me that. I'd honestly forgotten so much of that stuff. I can't remember who United Guttural was run by. Uh, I, I get it all. It, get, it kind of blends together with because uh, we had dealings with Unique Leader later on with uh, Eric and Unique Leader as well. Um so, yeah, I don't really remember too much. I kind of stayed out of the business side of it back then. I was just like, I'm a drummer. I'll show up and play drums. And that's about <laughs> it. And, <laughs> and Brain and, and Wayne and the other guys kind of handled some of the business stuff and label stuff. And I just, I was just there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But tell me about like that album artwork, because I know it was a, a Joel Peter Witkin's photograph of man without head in 93 three. How'd you end up like yeah. using that piece of art, art for the album cover? Again, this goes back to this guy's town, Paul Abair, who was kind of our sort of man, basically our manager that we, that helped us out a lot financially in the very beginning. Me and Wayne even lived with him. And he is the guy who drew our development logo. Um, he uh and who currently owns corpse crystal records um he um he has you know since he was a, he's a tattoo artist by trade so he has he's an art guy he has tons of art books and posters and things and he just knows everything and flips photography books and whatnot and uh he just showed us this one because i came up with the album title as well I was like uh um, molesting and capitated 
And then he just showed us all these photos in, in his book. And I think he selected that one and showed us, just kind of presented it to us. And we're like, uh, yeah, that's kind of perfect. Uh, fits with the title. It's grotesque. It's disgusting. It's kind of something no one's seen, I don't think, at that point. Um, and uh, yeah, that was it. We were just, and we were, you know, fucking trolls back then. We were just trying to be as extreme and sick and disgusting as possible. Um, I think it, it worked out. <laughs> yeah. And I also like the sample, the two samples that you use on festering vomitous mass and shroud of encryption. Shouldn't you yeah. use like the ser- interview with uh, Joseph Kellinger, the serial killer? How did you end? What made you decide yeah. to put do do those do like a samples from those interviews? And, and that's I mean, we always had an in, in mind to do some sort of sample because that was a lot of people were doing that at the time. We just felt it fit. Um, we we wanted some kind of you know grand intro or something that fit the extremity of the music. And I don't I don't know I honestly don't know where we got that Kellinger interview uh sound bite from but like somebody showed it to me and i was like oh that's perfect but i can definitely tell that's Geraldo rivera on um, talking on it which is i thought was hilarious but um yeah other than that it just again it was just something that was kind of presented to us and that we thought fit perfectly and we we're just like yeah we'll we'll take that put that there and do this and it just kind of worked out frankenstein monster and everything yeah and then kind of like the next next thing I want to talk about is the 138 compilation, which is just like some uh, old, some of the old yeah. demos. And I know there's that one song, Baby Killer. Or tell me about like Baby Killer. What's that song about and how did that come to be on uh, 138? Um, yeah, so the idea, I think the whole idea again for 138, again, got to give it to Hound, uh, Paul Hebert, um, for I think it was his idea originally to kind of compile the stuff because i think this was around 99 2000 uh by that point i quit the band end of 99 or so something like that early 2000 and the rest of the band just kind of fell apart so it just it was basically dead in the water at that point but he had the idea to put out something that was kind of felt final or whatever um so we had the uh three song demo and then we had mtd which is three songs and eight songs and then um, I don't remember whose idea it was to record one new song to put on this compilation thing. Um, but yeah, we just, um, maybe in Mike, because he wrote pretty much the, uh, most of the music. I mean, I helped with the arrangement and you know, some of the, the ideas, but he wrote the song. Um, but the, the concept was just calling it Baby Killer being... Uh, <laughs> came from all of us because it was kind of the reason I'd quit and like everybody kind of soured on the band and left all at the same time was that we all had an issue with um, our guitar player, Brian, at the time. We just didn't get along. We butt heads. We had a lot of issues personally uh, with him, not musically. And uh, we always thought it was, we always gave him shit because he had, he was a young guy and he had kids. None of us had kids back then. We're in our twenties or he had a kid at the time. And so when we started writing songs, we were like, okay, what about the lyrics? What are we going to do lyrically? You know, we want to go as extreme as we can with brutal gore, whatever, violent stuff. And he came to us, he had, he said, I have one rule. And one rule is that we can't sing about babies, (laughs) about (laughs) killing babies (laughs) or children or whatever like that. We're like, what? And we thought it was so hilarious. (laughs) <laughs> and off putting. So when we came back to write this one song, it was all of us except for Brain. Because we were like, all right, we're going to do this thing how we want to do it and fuck that guy because we don't like him anymore and blah, blah, blah. So basically, the whole the title is just a big little figure to, to our, <laughs> our original guitar player. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it, it's stupid and petty and it was, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I hate this song now. I hate the song lyrics, but it's like our most famous song at this point, which is what it is. So um, people like it. I mean, I, the music's fine. <laughs> I'm okay. We'd rather not play it, but um, people want to hear it. So if people want to hear it, we'll play it. All right. And kind of, kind of after you left the development for a little bit, were you in any band before you, before you started up uh, Meshia? Yeah, I had some false starts and a couple of 
cool things like in the early 2000s. Um, I guess post devourment when I quit in like 99 or 2000 or so, I wanted, I was just like out. I didn't want anything to do with music or I was so fucking done with it and sour on it. Um, but I was always one of the guys in the band, uh, me and Mike and I, I can't, maybe a couple others, Wayne. Um, back then it was very, I mean, maybe it is now, but I think it was more common back then for people that were playing death metal to only listen to death metal and be like hardcore purist and elitist about death metal. It's like, that's all you listen to. That's all you're exposed to. That's what you play. That's cool, whatever. But like, I've always listened to every type of music and always been a fan of all kinds of music. Just, I want to play death metal when, when I do, you know, create music. Um, so I had like, I was big into, that was right when like new metal was getting popular, right? And Korn and, the biscuit and like all these other bands and i was a huge static x fan so yeah. <laughs> still yeah, they're they're I fucking awesome one of my favorite bands of all time yeah and how do you feel about them so, now with uh, zero as the front uh, that's a good question uh we actually have ties to to wayne so it's it's kind of weird for me and my, my buddy uh brandon who um knew him personally and like we met him and talked to him uh, you know infrequently and we anyway um yeah so it's a little touchy subject but i think i i like what they're doing now i understand yeah. you know they're saying everything right whether they're you know it's a cash grab or not or whatever to me um you know the mask stuff or whatever can be questionable but i'm like i think they have the right intentions and bottom line at the end of the day it's exposing a whole ton of new people to static active music. And I think they're, they're doing it really well live. The show is really slick. They sound amazing. The guy, they got zero, whatever. He sounds as close to Wayne as anyone I've ever heard. Yeah, That was my reaction but, too. Yeah. Like how did they get a guy that, I mean, now I know who it is. It yeah. makes more sense, but like still, like when I first heard it, I was like, Holy shit, this guy's as close as you could ever hope to get. So like, you know, honoring Wayne, being like Wayne, whatever you want to call it. But, yeah. and I think the turnout and the response from the shows over the past couple of years seems to be, yeah, most people are into it and they yeah. get it and it's cool. Yeah. yeah um, I totally people, I'm agree. on board with it. <laughs> yeah. Same. Because yeah. I remember seeing them uh, last summer, they did that tour with Rob Zombie and Mudvayne and I, Medvay and I saw them right. in, in Alpharetta, Georgia, and I was like, wow, wow, that was pretty good. That's like good. It kind of like takes me back to like even discovering Static X when I was like in my like a teenager and stuff. Yeah, totally. So, uh, and, and to that point, that's like that was part of where I was going with my uh, the post development thing when I started. Like, I was always into like industrial metal and stuff, Fear Factory and Nine Inch Nails and all that yeah. kind of stuff too, which I still, still love. And, um, so that's kind of what I pursued post devourment early 2000s. And I just found a guy locally in Dallas, a guy named Brandon Slagle, who was a guitar player and singer in another band called Die Section, not Dissection, but <laughs> like Die Section. Yeah. And uh, I joined that band and that was kind of, we did that for a while. And that's where we had like a connection with Wayne Static was uh, we were kind of doing something similar to them in, in the industrial metal thing. And I don't know how, I think, I think it was because Brandon used to talk to like Wayne and some of the people that knew Wayne on forums and, you know, whatnot back in the day, which people did. And he kind of took us under his wing as like one of his pet project bands. So we like actually opened for like Static X at one of their Dallas shows and they had us do like a Roadrunner record showcase in LA and all this other stuff. So they were trying to groom, Wayne was actually trying to groom us to be like a band he could like bring up and you know that kind of thing so that was how we knew him and that i was just into that music and we, so we got fairly successful with that until things just kind of fell apart as they do sometimes the band um so that was like the biggest thing of notes that i did um post devourment and then i tried a couple times to do get back into death metal i didn't play death metal at all for like you know five six seven eight years oh, until wow. i tried to get get back together our start machine was uh, when I reconnected with Brian Wynn, our original guitar player from uh, Devourment, um, in around 2011. And that kind of, you know, hemmed and hawed and false started. And I think we got like, you know, one good song out of it. <laughs> but, um, so that was kind of cool. But that like got me back into playing death metal hardcore to 
and we and we you know did okay we did some festivals and, and things like that and then that got us back on some people's radar as like you know two og guys from the old school devourment versus the other guys in the environment were doing their own thing now and kind of evolved evolved in a different direction than what we were doing. So we thought we had you know a little niche there, but that's how we reconnected with development and eventually wound up back in development. Yeah, yeah, I do want to talk a, a little bit about Mashia because I love that little split you did with Perfect Perfect and you did like like the song commence the suffering which is just a yeah. fucking ass beater of a song and i know you actually covered for the devourment song choking on bile which is fucking brutal yeah yeah thanks um yeah like i said we just me and him reconnected we jammed again it, it, it was there again i felt good he felt good uh we uh yeah we just got and we, I think uh, we had Kevin back too for a little bit. So another kind of OG, the member of development. We've been out of it for a while. And uh, we found a, a singer who's killer, this guy um, locally, um, Joe Rioja. And um, just started kind of like pick, pretending like we picked up where we left off in 99, uh, basically. Like, what if we just stayed in development and continued it? Because, you know, Development went this way, and we felt if we stayed in it, it would have gone this way. So that was our deal with Mashia, basically. And that's why we were covering, like, Devourment songs while there was a Devourment <laughs> still yeah. playing shows. Um, and, but, yeah, yeah, and Commence the Suffering was, like, the, the one song I think that we had that I was really proud of that me and Brain wrote together fully and, like, showed some, that we had some potential there until... Again, personal issues <laughs> with brain and some of his, um, yeah, some, some things happened. He kind of disappeared for again and shit fell apart. And we tried to pick up the pieces and get um, some new members to fill in. And then just kind of like, but by that time, that was like 2013. Um, so he's gone its course. And then we, again, uh, the Chris from development reached out to us, uh, to me, I mean, um and then we started having talks about you know what about this so as machia was kind of falling apart on its own i got a lifeline from devourment and i was like this might work so yeah. that's kind of kind of what that led yeah yeah what was that like like coming back to devourment were you kind of like like nervous like picking up where you left off or was it just piece of cake i um well like we've been asked me and brian specifically brian Wayne had been asked a couple times prior to that to rejoin and just i just didn't think it was the right time or the right people the right lineup that for us to to do that with uh what like cinched it for me was like that and made me i guess more comfortable so i wasn't really nervous about about it was that um that it was that by that time everybody basically left and mike had, had kind of handed the keys uh, to to Chris Andrews at that point he was basically the lone development member so he was trying to reform it and called me up and was like okay well so it's just you and me I'm like yeah okay <laughs> um all right so does that mean we can kind of like start over and put together our own lineup and go like I guess yeah that's what happened so that I kind of got to rebuild it from scratch again and handpick who we wanted I mean we all agreed on these you know, that we both wanted Ruben back on vocals, our, you know, MTD singer, um, if he wanted to, if he had any interest in doing that. So that's one thing. And then jamming with Chris, because he was the bass player originally. Now he's trying to move the guitar and write music. And so that was a big quite That was what I was most nervous about. Because like, I never played with Chris before, and I've only known him as a bass player. I'm like, I have no idea what, he, what his guitar playing is like or what he writes like, how any of that. Is going to work because for me everything's about the music and the vision of devourment and you know this really this trying to be this most brutal death metal band around basically and um if that didn't work if i got in a room with him and me i played and he played and if, you know that thing wasn't there that it was when i jammed with brain back in the day then then i was gonna yeah have to make a, a choice <laughs> yeah. that i might not like to do. um but yeah but we did and it was there. He was awesome. And me and him jammed for hours and started writing new stuff and playing old Bama songs and it sounded like the old stuff. And 
Ruben said, yeah, I want to come back and sing and not play guitar anymore. And yeah. uh, we had Dave, my, who we had from Mashia, who's an amazing bass player. They're just kind of everything literally just fell into place. And we're like, uh, so yeah, my nerves, any nerves I had at that point were completely gone. The only other you know, question mark I ever had was my own playing ability at that point because I hadn't played death metal really seriously for any extended period of time. I just took, you know, a decade off basically. Uh, with the exception of Mashia, which that's what kind of Mashia kind of like, you know, got me back in the headset, uh, the mindset of of what I need to do, what I getting back into playing death metal at the highest level I can, you know, to outdo myself back in the day and be good enough to make devourment sound good. So, um, yeah, I was so I was stoked with that. I was I felt I was in a good place and everything just worked out. Yeah. And then kind of like flash forward to 2019, you dropped Obscene Majesty, which is definitely one of my favorite albums from 2019. How was, was that like making your first record record with the band in many years? Hey, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was probably the most daunting thing. And it's the single the one thing that took the most time. Um, because again, like I said, me and Chris had never really, written together or done anything creatively or musically other than play development songs at that point um so we started writing oh man i don't remember 2017 2016 so we took our time <laughs> and we really hammered stuff out it was old school like in the jam room just, he wrote a bunch of stuff and we would work on it hammer it out rearrange it chop it up um in the jam room for like basically better part of two years uh, or so before we felt okay i think we have enough songs and they're good enough that we want to put out an album now um yeah so that's what happened there and then we you know just got all the all this got our old producer the guy who produced um um molesting capitated to come back and also reprise his role and see if we could get some of that magic back <laughs> And uh, yeah, it went really well. We were really happy with the results and we did it, you know, in a kind of old school, traditional way that not a lot of modern death metal bands do anymore. So we thought that would be another reason that would try to separate us a little bit from, from everybody. Yeah. I still think it's a great, great album. Like everything from front to back, back is just great. Like songs like, like arterial spray patterns, profane contagion, and sculpted in tyranny, just all just, ugh. it just really just, every song just flows through from beginning to end. Thanks, man. Yeah, that's um, one thing, um, like we're really, that's why I said we took our time and we took a really long time hammering these songs out because both me and Chris and everybody in the band is, has a very specific vision. We're very picky. And I think we have a, I mean, I, I know I do, and I think Chris does as well, a very strong um, sense of songwriting uh, being a lost art, maybe in some death metal these days. Is, you know, there's a difference between just a collection of sick riffs and like writing a, a really well constructed song in terms of arrangement and, you know, how it flows and that kind of thing. So we focus really hard on on the songwriting aspect of it. So we wanted to make sure everything, um, you know, each song is its own piece. You can, you can tell it's not all the same, samey sounding kind of stuff, even though it's, you know, we're, you're constricted by playing brutal death metal. <laughs> and there's, you already have your set limits, but what can we do within, within that and still be creative? Yeah. Yeah. And it had, being it has now been, been four years since Obscene Majesty, have you all started like work on the next Devourment album? What's the status with that? Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, we just, um, uh, since we, you know, we did a few shows here and there and some festivals and then did a European tour last year. We did our first, uh, U S North American, U S Canada tour in like a decade, just this past couple of uh, the month, uh, in May. So, uh, yeah, the, the plan was, and as soon as we got back from tour, which is, you know, ended a couple of weeks ago is to start focusing on writing new music for whatever the next thing is album single ep something just to get going and see where where we go but yeah that's we're already already in the process of um writing the first couple songs right now all right 
and kind of wanted to break off from development. I know like last year you started up a project called Murderous. Tell me about like that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's my exit strategy, I guess. <laughs> that's my, like, if things don't, don't go great with development or no, it's just really, it's just another creative outlet because uh, I wanted to, like, I've always had a hand in the song writing and development, not, you know, since I'm the drummer, it's mostly like a James and Lars Metallica situation. James comes in with a million riffs, him and Lars, you know, chop it up and set the arrangements and that kind of thing. So that's kind of my role in terms of songwriting and development. And I, that's, that's cool that, you know, I, I'm still part of the creative vision and the process and like, um, because ultimately the band, the idea of development was my initial vision of this extreme brutal death metal band. So, and everybody, you know, in the band shares that vision at this point, but um, I just never had an outlet where, cause like I said, I started on guitar way back in the day. So I play guitar. Um, but I've never really written anything on my own from start to finish. So this is kind of a challenge to me to like be able to like, if, what if I had no other influence and pulled a Trent Reznor and just like solo everything, I'm just going to write everything. I'm going to try to be a death metal prince. I'm going to, I'm going to do the guitar, vocals, drums, bass, everything. And I mean, other people do that. Like uh, Matt Kilner from uh, Niving and uh, he is Niving project. So I can also, and that's, He's another death metal drummer that does everything. He, you know, gets another creative outlet besides his own bands um, where he can do that. So that's kind of what this is for me, just to see, because I want to do my own thing as well as development. All right. All right. I got two more questions for you, for you, if we have time. Yeah. Time so kind of like like talking about like coming from Texas, like, because I know there were Texas, like, obviously there's bands like Pan, Pantera. Terra, but of course there's also like the death metal bands like devourment and absolute but but how do you feel like the the newer new, newer kind of like de death metal scene with like bands like frozen crown and stat being being was how's the like the texas death metal scene feel feel now as to when you when you first saw it like thriving in the 90s i mean it's obviously just by so much time has passed it's very different yeah in the early 90s it was like underground it felt like an underground fight club kind of thing because you know the pre-internet it was tape trading and snail mail so like you had to be really into it and dedicated and all that other stuff and like most of the bands were kind of like still figuring out what death metal was or what it what kind of death metal they wanted to play back in the day like brutal death metal traditional death metal or black metal that kind of stuff so you had a very diverse section of bands that would all play together and it was it was really rad i mean um but now it, it seems like and it's there was a you know a lull i think for a very long time that not a lot of bands came out but yeah uh the past i don't know three or four years now there are some of my favorite bands are popping up out of the texas death metal scene and are blowing up which is awesome like frozen soul all friends of ours we know those all those guys um and creeping death and stabbing is one of my favorites um yeah and everybody's doing really well and they're like actually you know actually bringing it live and, and on albums and stuff now and um maybe kind of putting us back on the map um again so that's that's awesome and so we're not just the pantera <laughs> uh <laughs> you know <laughs> which i love pantera but like yeah we need, yeah. To, we need some more bands break out because yeah i was talking about this with my friend today is like when we kind of blew up back in the, I mean, the 90s that was we were big for that for underground death metal that was pretty much it which was still basically unknown but like now you know these guys are signed to, to bigger labels they're doing huge tours opening for big bands like when we started dying fetus was an underground band and nobody knew that we played with often and now they're like one of the biggest bands around same as you know cannibal and everybody else um so that's cool but uh that it seems like there's in general there's like a there's a revival of death metal in you know overall um interest in death metal and like you know some bands are doing the old school death metal thing which is cool too but, i mean it's it's all you know if the songs are there and, and you're doing it for the right reasons and it sounds fucking awesome then more power dude that's that's what it's all about 
Awesome. And sort of like the final question I want to ask is how like like talking about like your your gear up gear. I'm just curious, like what kind of like yeah. like like your drum setup, like what kind of drums you use, like like cymbals and t pedals and sticks and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually just uh, bought a last year. I bought a new Tama kit. My first like, you know, really. I decided to splurge and get like a real professional big time kit because since we had this uh, tour with Ingested uh, coming up, I was like, I use that as an excuse. <laughs> um, so I bought a Thomas Star Classic Walnut Birch kit. So I got the whole old school death, you know, the big death metal kit, double bass, three rack toms, four toms, uh, two snares. I got um, two Tama, um, what is it? A brass snare and aluminum snare, the Starphonic series. Um, I just, actually changed i used to i played scabian aax symbols my entire life until about three years ago and i changed to uh, minor uh classic custom dark everything so i got all new symbols on a kit uh i've always played evan's head that's i've just that's just how it's been saying evan's head's a pro mark stick i've used those for 20 years period like nothing else um trick pedals i use sometimes but i got a, a pair of those new pearl demon xrs the, the george Kalias thing um uh, pedals so i'm gonna try those out and see how i like those but yeah i'm a, I'm a gearhead for sure yeah yeah so uh before we go just want to thank you for this inter interview great to be able to talk with you, you today there's just anything else with the devourment you'd like to plug in terms of like tours and stuff uh, no, we just, uh, like I said, we just did our, you know, uh, our biggest tour in years and it was a great success. Thanks. I'd just like to thank everybody that came, that we met and came to those shows. It was amazing. It was epic. We had 29 shows over five weeks or so and sold out 13 of them. First time we ever played in Canada and we sold every piece of merchandise we ever, we had oh, period. Wow. And it was crowds or not. Yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing, especially uh you know for just I, I didn't even know like i mean i knew like i said that it's popular and people turning out shows are really good but like for what we're doing i it was by far the most successful thing i think we've ever done so yeah we're really stoked and thankful to everybody about that so that's hype and um yeah just hopefully we'll get some new music out and keep your eyes peeled for that we'll when that happens awesome so everybody brad from devourment we'll see you next time